uh, then we have actually Amy Stutz uh, coming up here, and uh, she is going to give a uh, talk, a review on uh, the, the, the huge sort of surveys that have come up uh, from Spitzer and also from Herschel on the uh, young stellar objects, uh, uh, their classifications and their evolution and time scales. Amy, it's a pleasure to have you here. All right, thank you, Ivina. So today I'm going to talk about the evolution of protostars. But I'm going to move that first. Um, so we've written a very beautiful chapter with a lot of nuance and complexity, and I'm going to dispense with a lot of that nuance and complexity, try to make a few key points. So it's in the protostellar phase that stars get their mass and protoplanetary disks are formed. So listen up. We have beautiful data in the optical shown here of star forming regions with a huge amount of complexity, but we do not see the protostars until we step out in wavelength <clears throat> to the infrared. And here we can see uh, the protostars are beginning to be revealed as these little red sources inside molecular clouds. And when we, when we step out further in wavelength, we can then see uh, with Herschel and some millimeter data, the cold and dense envelopes of these protostars, which are at about 10, 20 Kelvin. So each time we step out in wavelength, we see a new set of sources, even with Herschel. So what's the standard sort of picture that we need to keep in mind? <clears throat> what we have on the bottom here is a cartoon of the actual, how we envision the physical stages <clears throat> of protostellar evolution. And on the top, we have the actual observations, so starting from a pre-stellar core, which will collapse and form the first theoretically predicted compact object <clears throat> Uh, the first hydrostatic core, and that gets a question mark because it hasn't been conclusively observationally identified. And then we finally arrive at a proper protostar, an envelope-dominated system. And what I mean by that is that the mass in the envelope is, dominates over the mass in the disk and the star. As we step out further in wavelength, <clears throat> we then have slightly presumably more evolved protostars, the class I protostars, and we have the flat spectrum sources, and then we finally arrive at the class II YSOs, which have SCDs that appear more photospheric, but with an infrared excess. Now, in this diagram, I put a question mark on the flat spectrum sources because a subset, and I should note that they're classified as flat in the infrared regime, uh, the, a subset of these sources may actually represent the termination of the mass accretion phase for protostars. And as such, it'll be very interesting to understand this process of envelope evolution. So the key idea here is to make this link between the cartoon picture on the bottom, which is supposed to represent actual physics, and the observations, the emergent SCDs that we have, now that we have these beautifully sampled SCDs. So what is the census of protostars and young stars in nearby clouds? So we're going to take all of the protostars within 500 parsecs and try to say what their lifetimes are, how many do we find, and what are their basic properties. And these are the surveys that we've gathered. And the bottom line is that we now have more than 6,000 YSOs, of which more than 586 are identified as protostars. <clears throat> so the first step is the identification. I'm going to spare you show, show, I'm going to spare you the pain of showing you the elaborate schemes that people use, but the bottom line is that different groups use different schemes, and as a consequence, the YSO list are sub subject to 30 to 40 percent con contamination uh, because it's very hard to exclude um, what Neil refers to as vermin, basically. Now, this talk is about protostars. So what about the protostar list? They are also subject to 30 to 40% uncertainty due to different methodologies. And in this example, <clears throat> I'm showing the luminosity distribution of protostars from Dunham et al. Uh, compared to the Kryukova luminosity distributions as a dashed line, uh, yeah, the dashed line. <clears throat> 
And here we see a discrepancy at low luminosities, <clears throat> which is driven by the Dunham et al. requirement of a submillimeter detection. So it's likely that Cryukova et al. may suffer from elevated levels of contamination, but it's also likely that <clears throat> the Dunham sample may be incomplete. And for this talk, I'm going to predominantly speak about protostars that are either detected in the submillimeter or <clears throat> with Pox 70 micron data, and that would be the Orion uh, portion. And uh, yeah, so, so they, they should be more reliable. Now we want to go back to the classification system briefly and understand a little bit of the history. Originally, we classified sources based on the slope of the SED, and we didn't make a distinction between class one and class zero. Later, the class zero, the notion of class zero sources was introduced based on the ratio of the submillimeter, submillimeter luminosity to the bolometric luminosity. This is the um, submillimeter luminosity means it's, it's a luminosity at wavelengths longer than 350 microns. And then furthermore, we then had the bolometric temperature, which is the temperature of a black body with the same mean frequency, fluctuated mean frequency as the observed SED. Now the bottom two measures here are continuous, whereas the top one is discrete as outlined here. But what we really want to think about is this picture that I showed at the beginning. Does this classification scheme actually relate in a one-to-one -one way to the actual physical properties in the envelopes? And it doesn't uh, because of various degeneracies <clears throat> that affect the emergent SED of the sources that have nothing to do with the actual state, what, what's happening in the envelope, and have more to do with geometry and other things that we may not care about. So now that we've identified and classified various sources, in our chapter we present <clears throat> uh, lifetimes in the various regions. All the lifetimes are consistent. The center two columns here represent Orion. Uh, we've excluded a couple regions with some in incompleteness. And the lifetimes are basically consistent within their systematic error from region to region. And now we want to look at these evolutionary diagnostics that I mentioned. So the ratio of the submillimeter to bolometric flux versus the bolometric temperature, and see how well these things agree with the idea that we have these, these degeneracies in the observations. And so here I'm showing uh, three sets of points. We have the HOPS, the Orion sources, HOPS with 70 micron coverage in red, and the C2D plus Gould belt points with submillimeter detections in black. And then we have these uh, pink sources, which are Herschel identified protostars in Orion. And I'll talk about those a little bit later. <clears throat> now, on this diagram, the submillimeter, uh, L submillimeter over L bull and T bull agree about 84% of the time. So we're actually not doing too bad. But this statement is subject to main, the main caveat is that you actually have very well sampled SEDs in the submillimeter and far infrared. So in the chapter, we make the concrete recommendation that now that we do have a large amount of submillimeter data from bolometer arrays, both ground-based and space-based, that it's likely that the ratio of the submillimeter to bolometric luminosity will be a better envelope diagnostic. However, we want to keep in mind that the entire notion of monotonic, monotonic evolution along this diagram may be called into question by variations in the accretion processes in the protostellar phase. And that's what this broken arrow is meant to represent. You could jump around in non-trivial ways in this evolutionary diagram. <clears throat> so now we want to take t -bull and separate the class ones and the class twos. And if we do that, we find, the, uh, so, excuse me, the class zeros and the class ones. If we do that, we find that about 30% of sources are class ones, potentially more envelope dominated than, uh, I'm mixing my classes, I apologize. Anyways, 30% of the sources are class zero, and that implies a lifetime of 0.15 million years. But we want to remember, we're talking about lifetimes of classes, not stages. So we've made no link at this point to the actual physical conditions in the envelope. Now, we have many sources now 
that don't fit into this sort of standard cartoon picture of evolution. And we want to know what, what clues do these sources harbor to, to give us a more nuanced picture of protostellar evolution. And here I'm highlighting three examples. We have the Herschel-only sources here, the PBRs. We have the Velos, which are very low luminosity objects identified in the C2D survey areas. And then we have outbursting sources. And in aggregate, these sources represent at the very least, so all of these samples are subject to gross incompleteness. So they represent at the very least 10% of all known protostars. So our, our sort of standard cartoon picture has some problems. And we want to ask, then, what are the earliest stages in the evolution of a protostar? Whoops. Yeah. So I'm going to first talk about the PBRs and then the VELOs. And the idea here is that we're pushing out <clears throat> to colder bolometric temperatures, colder SEDs, and lower luminosities than we ever have before. So what are the PBRs? And this is an example of my work. And they are um, Herschel-identified protostars in Orion. They represent about 5% of, of the uh, current census of protostars in Orion. They're 70 to 24 micron colors, or limits, if they're even detected. Uh, some of them are not detected in the Spitzer bands uh, at all. Uh, are consistent with being stage zero. Uh, uh, sources. So at this point, you should get pretty excited because this is the first time I've drawn a link to anything that's, uh, you know, referring to the physical stage rather than the classes. In addition, uh, these sources have very cold uh, values for Tibel, so they're consistent with being class zero, and they have relatively short lifetimes. Um, and some of the PBRs are low luminosity and may be consistent with the VELO definition. And others potentially could be consistent with first hydrostatic core candidates, and next I'm going to talk about those two samples. So the VELOs are very low luminosity objects, as I said, and the scrutiny of some of these sources in detail reveals that they're probably explained uh, by, um, in multiple different ways. Some may be extremely low mass protostars, other may be, others may be older, and others in a low accretion phase, and others may even be proto-brown dwarfs. So the bottom line is that the velos do not correspond to one unique evolutionary stage. Now, we want to get the, to the first hydrostatic cores, so where are they in our sort of cartoon picture here? They're faint possibly very red. Some of them you may not even be able to place on this diagram, but just to get an idea. So what are these first hydrostatic cores? So the first core is the first optically thick, hydrostatically supported uh, core that's formed after the collapse of a pre-stellar core. It is composed of molecular hydrogen. And once the core heats up enough to dissociate molecular hydrogen, it'll undergo a second collapse, and at that point, the protostar is born. Now, these are the predicted properties, currently, that we've gathered from the literature. And they vary quite a bit, but in particular, I want to point out the variation of two orders of magnitude in the predicted lifetimes. So this should immediately tell you that it's going to be hard to identify these guys observationally. Now here we have some candidate first hydrostatic cores. I believe this is the first one that was presented in the literature in about 2006. Some of them are driving outflows. Uh, but the main thing is that we have identified nine of these things, and six are in Perseus. So only if we assume the longest possible lifetimes predicted by theory, so we're already stretching out into what we can explain with theory. Can these things be consistent with all being first hydrostatic cores? So the answer to the first question is no. We have not unambiguously identified the first uh, phases, the earliest phases of protostellar collapse. <clears throat> so this brings me to my next question. How do protostars get their mass? So we want to go back to our luminosity versus bolometric temperature diagram. This is our HR diagram for, for protostars. And note that the median luminosity of protostars is about one L sun. 
approximately. And then we are immediately confronted with a problem. Basically, on this side, the right side, we have the term that describes the accretion luminosity. And we know, we just presented a lifetime of about a little more than 10 to the 5 years. So we know that we have to build a one solar mass star in that time, so that implies 10 to the minus 5 solar masses per year have to accrete on average onto this thing. So we're going to go plug in some numbers and see what we get. And sure enough, we get an accretion luminosity that's at least an order of magnitude bigger than what we see. So if you're not depressed yet, the, the, the terms that I've highlighted in red here are the terms that lack any observational constraints. So we have to figure out what we're going to do about this problem. Possible solutions include longer lifetime, so more time to accrete more slowly at a lower rate, a, a lower radiative efficiency, and the non-constant mass accretion rate. Now, if you remember, the only quantity that was uh, expressed in powers of 10 when I plugged in numbers was the protostellar mass accretion rate, and we have an order of magnitude, at least, type problem. So we're going to pay attention to that one. We're going to say that's going to give us leverage about an order of magnitude on this problem. So here we have the historical models uh, for the mass accretion rate of a protostar. <coughs> Excuse me. And you know, these are basically the origin of the luminosity problem. And as time goes on, these are all core, everything I'm going to show right now are core regulated accretion models. So then we develop more, some more sophisticated models that do some different things in here. And, and then we want to ask, you know, what, what do disk-regulated accretion models tell us? So these are intrinsically variable models, where instead of dumping the mass onto the star directly, you have to process it through a disk. And they vary widely. And the basic question we want to understand is which ones fit the data. So we're going to grab our luminosity uh, distributions. That's what's shown here as the uh, gray histogram and compare first to a disk-regulated uh, accretion model as the dashed line. And we see that we're doing pretty good, so we're feeling kind of optimistic. We're coming back from our depression, right? And then we're going to show some of these other models for core-regulated accretion. And in the end, we have a big fail for the isothermal sphere model, but we can't actually distinguish based on the observed luminosity functions for protostars between models with and without some prescription for episodic accretion versus a more smooth uh, accretion process. So what's the observational evidence for any kind of changes in uh, the accretion rates <clears throat> on the protostars? First, I'm going to present a piece of direct observational evidence from Will Fisher, where he observed in Orion uh, a source that underwent a factor of 10 luminosity increase. And this is the least luminous Fiori outburster that's known, and only a small fraction of the Fiori outbursters that we know are classified as protostars. But I believe that Joel Green will tell you guys a little more about these sources on Thursday. So low luminosity bursts are consistent with some range of episodic accretion phenomenon, but how common and how frequent are they? That's an open question. Now we want to go back into the fossil evidence for past uh, accretion changes on the protostars. And here I'm highlighting some work by Hector Arce where they, uh, and collaborators, where they obtained beautiful 12CO ALMA data of the um, outflow around uh, this protostar and found a velocity pattern in these clumps consistent with uh, prompt entrainment of molecular gas by an episodic jet. And they, these, bursts, these, these structures were spaced in 100-year spacings. Now, the other piece of fossil evidence that I want to talk about is the double-peaked CO2 ice feature in the IRS spectra. 
So this feature, this double peaked feature, is observed towards many protostars. But the real significance of it is that it is an irreversible chemical process. process. Once you distill the CO2 ice, the pure ice feature is going to stay there in the envelopes. And it's observed towards, towards extremely low luminosity sources. Uh, so this indicates that there had to be a temperature increase at some point in the past capable of distilling the CO2 ice. So this is an interesting clue, and in particular, the uh, black line showed, the black spectrum shows um, HOP68, which has a particularly large fraction of CO2 ice. So there's growing evidence that bursts of accretion are common, but we don't know what fraction of the mass of final mass of the protostar is actually accreted in these bursts. Now, if we want to talk about episodic accretion, we also have to talk about disks. What's happening with the disks in the protostellar phase? So this was just summarized in the previous talk. All I want to say is that disk rotation allows the only direct means of measuring the protostellar masses. And here's an example that was just mentioned where Tobin and collaborators, John Tobin and collaborators, uh, measured a, a Keplerian velocity uh, pattern in, in this class zero protostar L1527. And future ALMA observations are extremely promising for measuring protostellar masses in a similar fashion. So finally, I want to talk about the effect of environment on protostellar properties. So this is one extreme example of the different kinds of environments that stars form in. And here we have the example of Barnard 335, which is that little smudge right there in the middle. And it, this is a small, isolated molecular cloud that is forming a single class zero protostar. And then we have, on the same scale, the northern portion of the integral-shaped filament in Orion. And there's dozens of protostars in here. So the first thing that we have to realize is that at most, 23% of these sources have the potential to be interacting with their neighbors. So they have overlapping envelopes. So we want to quantify this a little more. So this is the region uh, the northern portion of the integral shaped filament that I just showed, and we're going to compare it to a less actively star forming region further south, but still in Orion. And we identify our protostars, and in this region, they're tightly packed along the filaments, and then we want to measure our luminosities and so on. And so here we see the little points indicate the protostars, and we find that indeed the luminosities are higher, and the mean separations are lower in a more actively star-forming region. So this brings me to my conclusions, which I'm not going to read, but I just want to make one final note. Going with uh, Chris McKee's sort of idea that the future will be revolutionary, say that we really want to overthrow the class system. Thank you. Uh, very nicely uh, presented and also very nicely uh, on time. We have plenty of time for discussions. So I would say uh, please line up again at the, uh, uh, at the microphones. Um, that one is working again and uh, there is already somebody there and uh, we'll go down and we'll not forget the upper rows as well. So. Hi. Mark. <coughs> Mark Krumholz. So, uh, I was wondering about your environmental dependence and what can be inferred from that about how much of an influence episodic accretion can have. And the reason I say that is that, right, so episodic accretion, at least in most of the models that have been proposed, is fundamentally a disk phenomenon. And it's not obvious why that would be environmentally dependent. So, I'm, so I'm wondering if you've thought at all about how much you can, w whether you can use the observed environmental dependence to say something about how much the solution to the luminosity problem could come from disk physics, which isn't environmentally dependent, versus 
the variations in the accretion rate which are? Well, first, no, I haven't thought about this. Second, uh, you know, maybe I'm being naive, but you say disk, the disk physics is not environmentally dependent, but the variations in the accretion rate are. So if we're processing material through the disk, but it's being fed from interacting envelopes, maybe there is an de environmental dependence, or maybe I'm missing something. Well, well what I'm suggesting is, I mean, the burstiness that occurs in the models is due to gravitational instabilities in the disk, at least in, in the models that have been made. So what's driving that fundamentally, the reason it's bursty is not because the external accretion rate is going up and down. Right. It's because the disk itself is. Okay, so it's not so. What I, so it is not at least obvious to me why you'd expect the the burstiness in the disk to know something about the environment. You know, it's not that the environment. It's not that the accretion rate right. is going up and down. It's that the disk is bursting in ter due to internal processes. So I, I, I don't have a good like answer. sounds like an excellent uh, research project uh, for everybody to do today. <laughs> You're looking forward to a model uh, that explains that, yes. Andres Carmona, Grenoble. My question is if you could make a comment about multiplicity, binarity, and things like that in protostars. Um, I believe that Tom and um, his student are working right now on a paper with HST data, trying to constrain this. Um, I don't know if Tom wants to take that question, but I don't know where he is. Your, your statistics, how do you change the, result, the statistical results you so, have for the masses, for the equation rates, this kind of thing? I'm not sure. Anybody from the team who wants to answer that question? <coughs> ah, Neil, yes, go ahead. Well, if most stars are binary, it can change by a factor of two. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Uh, let's first go upstairs now. Let's see. Uh, is there a question there? No? Any on that side? No? Okay. Let's uh, then we could continue here. My name is Tom Saka from NAOZ. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my question about uh, structure, which is seen in HH46. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, you, you, you are saying that that is an indication of the actually accretion. However, the, the from my view, that uh, structure is very uh, regularly placed. Yeah. This, yeah. Displacement. Uh, the separation is almost the same. So right. the, that kind of structure may be formed by the supersonic jet, in the uh, supersonic jet, by Mach disk. That uh, there are lots of steady shock fronts uh, formed in the supersonic jet, which is uh, 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 ejected in the ambient medium. So the, do you think? So? Kind of well, I mean, I think it's very hard to make the link between, you know, the structure that we see in outflows and what's actually happening with the mass accretion processes. But this is just one example of some evidence. But it's, it's I don't think it's uh, alone. It's not total. It's not conclusive. I, I think the digital jets physics and outflow physics will probably be addressed in uh, Sophie Cabri's talk, uh, if, if that is also what you're asking. That, yeah. Um, yeah. Ralf Neuhäuser, uh, when you presented uh, the lifetimes of the class ones, you mentioned you measure them with respect to class twos, assuming a two million year lifetime for class twos. Half life. Oh, half life, yes. I, I might say that this might be a, a wrong assumption. I know one young star which is 200,000 years old, with a, which is class three, another young star which is 10 million years old and class two. Well, so I'm the, lifetimes have a very, very large range of at least two orders of magnitude, not even taking into account what we may hear in the next talk. So therefore, maybe also the life, lifetimes of class one and class zero, which you uh, derived, might be wrong by two orders of magnitude. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> 
I, I don't think they're wrong by two orders of magnitude, but, but there's a lot of uncertainty. And anybody that get up, gets up here and says there isn't would be lying, basically, right? about the inclination of possible disks um, because when you look at SCD models for disky stars you, you, you could mis, uh, misinterpret an object which is almost edge on as a, as a class zero yeah. um, and I think there are some couple of examples in the past where a, a, a more proper analysis showed that an object that has been classified as class zero <coughs> is actually class two mm -hmm. um, and my question is, you know, you do all these surveys, have lots of data, can you, uh, is, there any, is, is there any method that you can disentangle? I mean, you, you showed you basically go through SED analysis, but e even if that's the only thing you, you, you actually use, classify, uh, there's an interesting thing, you could actually learn something about the thickness of the disk by the statistics of your classes. So, okay, my, my conclusion is maybe, you know, looking at the inclinations may help to disentangle classes from stages. I, I, I don't know. I prefer looking at the submillimeter emission from the cold envelopes and deciding that way if you have something that you think is envelope dominated and then you can split, you know, get lost in a lot of details about what that really means, but Ultimately, I think you need to detect that cold material in the envelope. And that's why we recommend using the submillimeter to bolometric luminosity ratio, because it's less subject to these degeneracies that t ball I think, is subject to. So that's what I would say. Um, in terms of a statistical analysis of what amount of contamination we might have and what we're claiming are class zero sources, we haven't looked into that. Uh, but I think that I would just avoid the whole issue and go to actual detections of the cold emission from the envelopes mm -hmm. and call those things protostars. But it's interesting also that the hop sample, we don't require a millimeter detection, but we, but we do require a 70 micron detection with our pox data. And that's also getting into a regime where you require the presence of an internally heated source so that also is another possible venue, I think. Yeah, if I just can add, add to that, uh, I mean, some of us have been using uh, HCO plus, centrally concentrated HCO plus emission on the core um, with a certain strength that cannot be consistent with an uh, uh, edge-on disk um, uh, in order to separate sort of the inclined uh, uh, class one sources from the, the class two sources. So. Uh, that's another method that you can use. So I think there have been ways of, of working on these uh, so-called misfits. But I think the, the, the ultimate one is just to do large samples also with Alma. That's, uh, <laughs> sorry to bring this up again. Uh, <laughs> that's, uh, to, uh, to, to really get sort of the, the, the concentrated emission versus the large scale emission. Um, good. Uh, any other questions? Anything more upstairs? Oh. So, sorry. Yeah. Hello. Sorry. Hi. Uh, so I have a question. Uh, if you happen Who's to have speaking? Here, oh, here, 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 here. <laughs> so if you happen to have IRS spectra for those uh, protostars, and you're after the fraction that are having episodic accretion, have you considered the idea of checking the crystallinity or the amount of crystalline silicates in those spectra as a measure or as a signature of possible episodic accretion? Um. I don't work on IRS spectrum, so I'm not, I'm not, I don't have a good answer to that question, unfortunately. Uh, but I, I guess I haven't, from the people that I've spoken to that do work on this, they don't necessarily look at those features as signatures of episodic accretion, but maybe it's a good idea. I'm not sure. I mean, the, the strength of the CO2 ice technique is that it's this irreversible process that requires this temperature threshold, and I'm not sure that the situation is always as clear cut. So, I mean, whether or not it's episodic accretion or not causing the distillation of ices, you know, it could have shocks in the outflow perhaps or something like this. But anyways, it's, it's sort of an interesting piece of evidence. Yeah, I think observationally in the early stages, the embedded stages, the silicates features are in absorption, so it's difficult to see the, the crystallinity in that, at least much more difficult than in the, 
the emission uh, part in the disks. So, yeah. Uh, yeah? yeah One Tracy more. Huard University. Is this on? Yeah, it's on. Mm -hmm. uh, Tracy Huard University of Maryland. I'm wondering if you can say a little bit more about the first hydrostatic cores, uh, in, in particular the numbers uh, that you are seeing compared to the numbers of class zero sources. Um, you mentioned that there's a, uh, an uncertainty uh, expected in the lifetimes of about two orders of magnitude. And at the top end of that range is about 10 to the fourth uh, years. I think that's what you said, which is about a tenth of uh, what that, what's expected for the class zero sources. Um, it seems the numbers that you're seeing are not really approaching that number. And in, in you also mentioned that a lot of these candidates are in Perseus. Right. Um, is, is there a reason for that? And uh, I mean, for me, I think the underlying reason for that is that they're mostly class zeros. Um, there's too many first hydrostatic core candidates, I think. And so... But what, you had a lot of class zero sources. You had a roughly... Uh, was it 600 class zero sources? So no, no, but, but you have to look at just Perseus, and I don't remember what the number of class zero sources is there, but you have to compare it to that number, well, not, not the total number of all known protostars. Sure, but you're a, saying there's, there's nine candidates, Perseus, so... But you don't, have a, you don't have a whole lot. You don't so, have so any So we haven't searched camp. in all the other regions, okay. Okay. right? So, so the relevant number is the same molecular cloud, which has been scrutinized, has some number that I don't remember of class zero sources compared to six th first hydrostatic core mm -hmm. sources. And then you hit a problem with the lifetimes where you have to assume the longest possible. So my view on this is that what we really need is tighter theoretical constraints. So we cite all these theorists in our chapter, and we hope that that spurs them on in their excellent work. Thank you. If, I, if I could just follow up on that, can you, can you sort of, how would you observationally distinguish a low luminosity class zero source from a first hydrostatic core? What is the key observational difference? Well, I hope that Alma will help, but there's also some ice, and I'm, I'm not totally joking, but I, I also think that um, there's some ice features maybe, but you know, we need some facilities and so on. E Melissa Enoch proposed some venues. Uh, but I think we want to get to catch the outflows when they're young. But then we need to know, do we expect them to be collimated or less collimated? And in terms of that kind of thing, the theorists are a little bit sort of all over the map. It would be useful to get more sort of really observational uh, yeah. sort of distinguishing between the two. Um, yes, the, the lead author. <laughs> Mike Dunham. Um, yes. I just wanted to comment a little bit more on the, the first course um, with what Tracy and then what Avian asked. The, first of all, with the lifetimes, I think there's many theorists here that could explain this a lot better. But um, 10 of the four years, that's really the upper, upper, upper limit. Um, and I think the only way you got uh, lifetimes that lasted that long was with uh, very low mass cores with a lot of rotation. So I think uh, 10 to the 2 to 10 to the 3 is, is more typically what, what you see. Um, and it, so if you take those lifetimes um, and the number of protostars in Perseus, you, you expect 0.06 to 6 first cores, and 6 being if it really is 10 to the 4 years. So that's why we say there's probably too many. Um, there's so many in Perseus probably because they're discovered somewhat serendipitously. There are no real large-scale surveys for them yet, be partly because they're very hard to find, although Alma will probably change that. Um, I had something else I was going to say, but I don't remember, so I'll just stop. <laughs> okay, well, this seems a very appropriate moment then to thank uh, both Amy and Mike and their team for a uh, wonderful uh, chapter and contribution. Thank you.